Hello again and welcome to the Blueprint of the Universe where we're looking at sacred history and particularly um, the Egyptian dynasties where the passing and teachings of Toth have been passed on through the family line, the, uh, the king line and the priest line, the pharaohs and the, the high priests of the time. And we looked in our previous video about when the dynasties basically came into collapse at the end of the sixth dynasty where the rulership had, uh, or, well, the attempt to become a utopia had destroyed itself by uh, spreading the wealth into nobles, where they seized power from the king themselves. They kept the king as a title, kind of um, ceremonial position, very much what we think that the king in England is now, but not really. That's a different kettle of fish, but. Um, in their terms, it was just a, a role to be filled which had some sacred family knowledge that got passed on from person to person view by a ritual, um, but not much else at all. And that's where we begin on the... We're going to kind of blend the next three um, periods together, the 7th, 8th and 9th dynasty. And the reason is that we, um, we kind of all intermingle in terms of events and timelines, which is why we're going to do a video on all three together. And it's also not too much happens within the majority of this, but it's important to keep track of, because again, it's the bloodline, it's the family line, it is the king's line, so it's still important to track at this given period of time. So we begin the 7th um, and 8th dynasty combined, which is the uh, main family line, you see, that we uh, we got passed on from um, Sipta. And we begin uh, this by looking at the, the, the kings in that line. Um, and so we follow the line through, and the names of the, the, the rulers of that time um, uh, Nefekara the second, Nefekara the third, um, Dejikar Semai, uh, Nefekara the fourth, Marinahor, uh, Nefekara Min, Nikara, Nefekara the fifth, uh, Nevekahor, Nefekara the sixth, Nefekara Harmin Anu, uh, Kahir Ibi, Nefekara again, Nefekara Hohor. And finally, Nefikara. And the, these are the combined versions of the 7th and 8th um, uh, dynasties. And that ends around 2055 BC. Now, again, we can see the very small roles, very small reigns. Just one after the other. Not really contributing to society so much. Um, and that's why there's so many kind of bulked into a small period of time. What we generally see is that when rulers have these very short reigns, they're not um, they're not centered around spirituality, they're not um, adding to the cultural society uh, or anything like that. They're just puppet roles um, as such. And what we do have is the conjoined Ninth Dynasty. Now the Ninth Dynasty comprises of, again, it's actually a relative because we saw how the nobles actually married into the um, king line with Pepe the first there. Um, so they are actually related, but we don't hold the spiritual line as such. It's just a noble. And the noble themselves, um, he was called Mary Hibir Kaheti um, and ruled about 2160 um, BC for quite a while. And the, the point is here that he wasn't a appointed ruler, he wasn't part of the bloodline, he didn't undertake the king-making ritual. He was a noble that became the noble of nobles. He basically lied, cheated, steal, um, and bought his way to the top position. And he earned himself or proclaimed himself as the pharaoh of the Ninth Dynasty. And so what we see is the actual spiritual line of knowledge was held with the priest line, uh, kind of hidden out of sight, um, you know, in the temples and, and uh, the priesthood, probably also in the outlining villages and tribes on the outside of the city, kind of away from the politics, being kept safe. So the main city itself, quite literally, uh, was without its mind, because the spiritual aspect that had held itself together, that was the key point of the civilization being created, the building of the pyramids, its guidance into civilizational growth, was all based around spiritual development and the trance state and the king-making ritual and the court of the king. Now all that had gone because they were just focused on greed, politics, wealth and, and money. and 
the central civilization was just breaking down. There was no trade going on because it was, um, you know, we were not interacting with other civilizations. They weren't growing. There was no culture development. It was just a very toxic atmosphere at this time. So looking at the Ninth Dynasty, um, out of the three, the seventh, eighth, and ninth that we're looking at, things begin to develop at the end of the ninth um, with a little bit of change. So we have Merihiba Kehiti, which is the um, self-proclaimed uh, pharaoh of the ninth, which was the the lord, uh, the noble of nobles, the wealthy of the wealthy. Um, now we do know there was one other individual there that was also um, amassing slightly more power than the other nobles as well. And we'll get to him in a second. But what happens is um, around 2140 BC, Nefekara the seventh appears. Now Nefekara the seventh is a direct descendant of Nefekara the second, who was one of the ones in our bloodline that we've been following. Now Nefekara the seventh decides that actually he's had enough now and his family needs to take back pride of place as the pharaoh line. So there must be some knowledge there within the family passed down for, for this to happen. So it's, you know, he, he obviously has, he thinks, well, I am the king, our family is royal, we have the king making ritual, uh, this needs to stop, we need to take power. So he begins to try and fight the nobles um, in an, an economic and polit political battle. And so Nefekara and his following two sons, Nebuchadnezzar Keti and Setu, um, around 2130 BC, begin to claim back um, a reasonably larger part of the uh, kingdom. And at the same time, a third individual who we mentioned previously, um, who was actually called Intef the Elder. Now, the title of Elder generally gets given to kind of a high ranking military general, as we saw with Weni in the previous dynasty. Now, the Elder. Uh, specifically isn't given a, a rank or title of king or prince or whatever noble but he obviously is with the title of elder and, and, and kind of having a large portion of military might and forces actually starts to perform a coup against the nobles now whether this was because um, he want power for himself at this time is something we will look into or if he was under orders from another source. Now, Intef the Helder also carves out for himself quite a large portion of the um, civilization uh, himself. So now the actual entirety of Egypt is kind of carved out between these three groups of people. So we have the kind of royalists of uh, Nefekara the seventh and his, two, his son and his grandson, Satut. Um, we have Merihiba Kehiti, um, who controls kind of the nobles um, and the general uh, populace that's been around for the last few um, dynasties. And then we have Intef the Elder, who has a large military force and is coming uh, to carve out a portion of the um, kingdom for himself. So we have these three major powers and nice triplicy. And we must also remember that there is the priest line also knocking about at this time. Um, so we have this kind of um, volatile status but also this coming together of viewpoints within the culture and the people because obviously the people follow certain viewpoints as well. And so we have you know, those that uh, are happy with the way things are, those that are not. Uh, and we always have this division between the right and left sides of, of the community. And that's what this begins to manifest. So, whereas before we had complete and open chaos, now it begins to amalgamate or distill itself into these conjoined three kind of points of view um, where people probably begin to shift in position and location as well within the society because they don't want to live somewhere that's ruled by um, like, uh, the economists or um, the royalists for example and we see these shifting patterns within the civilization itself within the period of this period of time of the ninth dynasty so let us look a little bit more closely at um, Intef the Elder. So Intef the Elder um, was positioned uh, quite prominently in the Lower Kingdom, which is where the um, Weni the Elder um, took control uh, in the past and made it a more of a military um, kind of led society. And um, the 
the, the idea that the area was ruled by a military leader was something then um, out of the bloodline as such. Now, what we can see is that Intef the Elder actually seceded power. So once he'd come in and um, uh, claimed the area for himself and unified it as, as one particular nation within a nation, um, he actually um, undergoes a change. So he gives his rulership to a man called Mentu Hotep. Now, his rulership only lasts for a couple of years, um, and it's unlikely that Mentu Hotep just appeared and took over this general's role by force. It was likely handed to him. So, the loyalty of the main Egyptian army, control of half the kingdom, of the, the, the lower kingdom, just was given to Mentu Hotep. Now, if we look at that for a minute, Mentu Hotep's name is Hotep. And the Hotep name is specifically reserved only for the Hotep family, who is the high priest's family line, comes from Imhotep. Um, so it's extremely likely, if not a certainty, that Mentu Hotep was the descendant of Patu Hotep Tijeti, who was the last in the line of the high priests. So what we see is that Nefekara VII and his two descendants have one third of the country, whereas Mentuhotep, who was the high priest's family, ruled another third of the civilization. So, and we know that these two, the king's line and the high priest's line, have a very solid band. Yes, it's been in kind of waning over the last couple of dynasties, but that's just because of the circumstance. The concept of it is linked side by side as duality that the priest line and the king line go hand in hand and this is taught to those individuals as part of the ritual and so what they've done is they've behind the scenes maneuvered themselves to control two of the three parts of the kingdom outside of uh, the, the Kaheti family and that's extremely important because we can see this kind of manipulation of the two sides coming together as one so interestingly enough, what we actually see is these um, three powers with a secret bond between the king and the priest line, and then we have the noble line. But what happens is, because the nobles are so committed to gaining power against the king line, they become blind to the attack from behind. And what happens is they actually unite. So the Meri Kaheti actually unites with Intef the Elder. And Intef the Elder actually takes power from Meri Kaheti. Um, because he's not family, you know, he doesn't have the family line. Um, it's likely that when he dies, or if he dies in that time, that, you know, the, the rulership's going to get passed on to the person with the largest army. So Intef the Elder and Mary Kaheti actually worked together against uh, Nefekara the Seventh and his two, his son and his grandson, Satetu. Um, Satet, sorry. And they, so Intef the Elder actually starts to become the ruler of both kingdoms, which then gets passed on to Mentu Hotep. So once he's got that, he passes it on to Mentu Hotep. And Mentu Hotep then rules two thirds himself, but the other third he's got an alliance with, that's kind of behind the table, or under the table as it is, with the king line. So we have, again, the civilization split into two. So we have those ruled by Mentu Hotep, and those ruled by Satut. And these two um, are in alliance with one another, unbeknownst to the nobles as such. So they don't see that uh, kind of deal that's going on behind the scenes. But what we do know is that Mentu Hotep I is actually also called the Ancestor, which makes sense because he's got a bloodline related to um, the high priest family line. So that makes perfect sense. What we also see then is Menti Hotep's two sons, Intef the First and Intef the Second, um, and uh, who have a period of rulership themselves of that part of the kingdom, um, were named after Intef the Elder. Now the only reason this would happen is if Menti Hotep had married into the line of Intef the Elder uh, in order to claim 
part of the power which was given to him. So after after taking control of two parts of the kingdom, Intef the Helder actually marries one of his um, family members. It's more likely his daughter um, rather than one of his kind of sisters to Mentuhotep, um, and that's why the family name carries on with Intef. You see, because otherwise it wouldn't have a place. It would go to Hotep as before. Uh, and so Mentuhotep has two sons, um, which have complete control of um, one one half of the civilization, uh, which they um, have brought back from the control of the nobles. Uh, and that's where we kind of leave this period, the Ninth um, Dynasty. So it's now split into two, with two halves. One is a unofficially ruled by the nobles which are in league with the high priest Lime and the Hoteps but equally the other half is part of the king ruling line and, and Satut and um, the Nefikara uh, family line and so unbeknownst to the nobles at that time they are back to where they started uh, being subjugated by the king and the priest line in an attempt to reforge um, and uh, reforge the utopian society to try and uh, attempt to bring about the spiritual knowledge back to the um, pre-planned culture of uh, Toth. And that's where we leave that for now. Um, so we have these two, two forces in play at this time, and we'll look at what happens next to these two players, uh, two family lines, in the next uh, 10th, 11th and um, 12th dynasty. So please stay tuned for that, subscribe, um, and that will pop up when it's available. Um, please like and leave a comment also if you want any further information on any of these aspects within this video. Um, so yeah, that's it for now. Thank you for watching and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Hello again and welcome to a blueprint of the universe where we're looking at sacred history and particularly um, the Egyptian dynasties where the passing and teachings of Toth have been passed on through the family line of the, uh, the king line and the priest line of pharaohs and the, the high priests of the time. And we looked in our previous video about